thing that really um, uh, got me interested was, as you say, the gyroscope. In, in a plane, there is a, um, an artificial horizon, okay, and it's based on a gyroscope. And if you spin a gyroscope um, on a surface, it will want to stay upright. You can twist and tilt the surface as much as you like, the gyroscope will stay upright. So, if a plane has a gyroscope and it starts um, following the curve of the Earth, mm. the gyroscope would stay upright, which mm. means your, the uh, um, artificial horizon will start to, to roll backwards. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's absolute proof that a plane flies over a flat surface rather than a curved one. Because um, I asked the pilot um, on my last flight, uh, you know, does, do you ever notice the, the, auto, um, the artificial horizon uh, rolling backwards? He said, no, no, but the artificial horizon has complex electronics in it to, to make sure it knows where it is on the Earth and it compensates. But I went to um, the manufacturer of the artificial horizon and they confirmed to me that it's completely mechanical nothing electronic in it at whatsoever. So it's, it's literally just a gyroscope that can freely move. So that right there is proof to me that um, you know, planes fly over a plane. None of it makes sense. The, the problem is that we're taught as children um, you know, uh, this, this ball earth lie. And um, you, know, you might ask as a child, you know, um, what about the people in Australia? You know, they're standing on the bottom of the globe, won't they fall off? And your teacher says, no, no, gravity. And you go, oh, okay. And you never, never go back to that question. But when you go back to it as an adult and start looking at it with a critical eye, right, the whole thing falls apart. As you say, the, the globe is, is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's um, a leading astronomer in America, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, bitch. Tells us that, that the Earth is not a perfect circle, it is actually an oblate spheroid, it's squashed mm -hmm. and, uh, and wider at the equator. Yeah? So, Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's, an, it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. So my question to him would be, why is there land at the equator? Because um, water will move more readily than rock. So if the Earth is spinning, the water will be um, collected at the equator. I mean, if you spin a wet um, tennis ball, Okay, you spin a wet tennis ball, the water shoots off mm -hmm. at the equator, essentially. So all the water will be g um, gathered around the equator. So why is there land at the equator? Doesn't make any sense. Um, the other thing that, uh, about s the spinning Earth is looking at the stars. Now, um, directly above the axis of spin is the pole star, Polaris okay, um, directly over the North Pole. And um, we're told that the reason that all the stars spin around the, uh, the, the North Star is because the, the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour, okay? Seems to make sense because if you put a long exposure camera uh, pointing at the North Star, you'll see um, the stars will make perfect circles around, perfect star trails. The only problem is the, um, the Earth is also orbiting the Sun at 67,000 miles an hour, okay? The Sun is moving, dragging the Earth and all the, all the planets up that way or that way um, at 600,000 miles an hour. So why do we see perfect circles, you know? Because that's the slowest speed, <laughs> that's um, the slowest motion in that, in that mix. And, and yet the, the Earth is moving 67 times faster that way and 600 times faster that way. So you should see the stars do all sorts of strange mo um, motions, but you don't. You only see them make these perfect circles. 
that tells me that it's the stars that are moving, not the Earth. The, the thing is, what, what the scientists will give you is calculations and, uh, you know, and theories why that happens. But we have experience. We, we see things and they either make sense or they don't make sense. And what the, the scientists do is substitute our, our common sense and our intuition for calculations and theory. And we're supposed to believe the calculations rather than what we experience uh, ourselves. Um, there was a famous experiment back in the 1800s in England uh, called the Bedford Levels experiment. Now, the Bedford Levels is a, a canal that uh, is perfectly straight for six miles. Okay, so what um, a chap called Samuel Rowbottom did was he took a telescope, put it in the water about eight inches above the water, and he had a friend, yeah, um, had a friend in a rowboat with a flag on the back, row all the way to the other end, and he was able to see the uh, the flag on the back of the rowboat the whole distance. Now, according to spherical um, trigonometry. Um, the curve of the Earth is eight inches per mile squared. So um, over five miles, um, that's um, five times five, 25, um, times eight, which is 200, which is, works out, that's 200 inches, which works out at 16 feet. That means the boat should have been 16 feet below the horizon. He shouldn't have been able to see the boat. Now, um, you know, the scientists will say, oh, refraction and this and light bending around the earth and stuff. Um, but, but the fact is, you know, it was, it's perfectly flat. And, and he, he, in his book, he's, uh, he, he puts forward many, many arguments that show that, or many, many experiments that show the earth is always perfectly flat. They say they, that you see the, uh, the mast, wow. you know, go, go down last. It's, it's literally just the way your, your vision works. Yeah, it's perspective and, and atmospherics, basically. Um, the, you, the limit of your vision is supposedly three miles. And then after three miles, you're supposed to see the, the boat start to uh, go over the horizon. It's funny that Neil deGrasse Tyson, again, says that, um, explains that you can't see uh, the curvature of the Earth from a plane. He says this, you can't see the curvature of the Earth from a plane because you're not high enough. The Earth is so big that um, you can't get high enough to see the curvature. Yet, you can apparently see a boat go over the curvature over the, th over the distance of three miles, which doesn't make sense. The thing is, when you, when you um, look out and you see a boat start to go over the horizon, if you suddenly get a pair of binoculars and look, it comes back again. And once it goes out of the sight of your binoculars, if you get a telescope, yeah, it comes back again. It doesn't go over any, any, any curve of the horizon. What we found, um, many people have done experiments with uh, very high-powered zoom um, cameras. And they, they've watched a boat go sail out to sea, and they've just kept trained on this, on this boat. And what they see is, after a, a very long distance, you see an atmospheric effect where, um, the bottom of the boat disappears and starts and, and the top of the boat inverts so you see a sort of mirror image and that um, with your eyesight you know you basically the bottom of the boat just melts into the uh, into the horizon one of the best examples of that is the um, Antwerp Notre Dame Notre Dame spire which can be seen something like 240 kilometers away from uh, you know, from the spire. So um, that should be over a mile below the horizon, and you can still see it. Um, there's been a few famous examples uh, just recently of uh, a man who took a picture across the Great Lakes from Michigan and was able to see, I believe it's Chicago, um, which he shouldn't have been able to see. And the, uh, yeah, and the news, uh, the television um, station basically said it was a mirage. This is from Joshua Nowicki, and what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. Um, but <laughs> they always say it's a mirage, but um, for a mirage to happen, you have to have very specific atmospheric um, conditions. And there have been so many people who have seen exactly the same thing on different days, different seasons, um, always the same. Um, 
You know, it's not a mirage. It's simply that you, you know, you're, you're looking across a plane. You see in a kind of pyramid shape, yeah? You, you, you have a horizon at your eye level and everything above the horizon um, will go down into the horizon, yeah? Everything below the horizon will, will seem to go up. Just like if you look in, you're in a long hallway, you'll see that the, the walls will start to move in and the roof and the, and the floor will start to move into to the centre. Yeah? So, literally, um, between you and the object you're looking at, there's all sorts of, uh, of things, sort of like waves going up and down. And while you can't see them, if they're beyond the limit of your sight, they're still, sometimes they can still obscure what you're looking at. Um, but it's just because they're between you and it. And um, it's just the way, it's literally perspective. Um, um, it's better if I could uh, draw a, a diagram, but uh, it's a very difficult uh, subject to, to get your head around if you're not used to it. Um, but it is perspective. Um, one, one sort of other proof is um, there's a place in Bolivia called um, Salar de Uyuni, which is a, a salt flat. It's literally 100 miles um, wide one way and 80 miles across and it's perfectly flat. And when it rains, um, literally uh, you get an inch of water and it looks like a perfect mirror. Um, now, how does that happen on a, on a, on a, a, a sphere? Yeah, it shows you that you know, if you're one end of this, this salt flat, you can see perfectly clearly the other end, 100 miles away. Um, so it's just showing you that uh, you know, um, the, the Earth is flat and um, without the effect of the waves in the sea, you, you, you'd be able to see um, a whole lot further. If you were to go to NASA and download one of their photos of the Earth in the moon's sky and put it in Photoshop, okay, um, drop the saturation and the, the levels down, you'll see that uh, the Earth is, has been pasted in because you'll see a rectangular box around the, the Earth. It's, it's all fraud, it's all fake. Um, pretty much everything NASA puts out is, is fraudulent. There are, there, are no, there are no images of Earth um, from space. Uh, the only one that NASA actually claims is a photograph was from 1972, and it's the, the famous picture. It's got, um, it's got Africa sort of near the top, and it's the, the same picture they've been using for, for the last 40 or 50 years um, in every textbook. Um, every other image is, a, is what they call a composite. It's Photoshop. There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just hit Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. It, what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. but. I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. And um, many of us have been looking at these these images of Earth, um, including the one they called the Big Blue Marble which is, was released in 2002, I think. Um, again, when you zoom into it with Photoshop, you'll see where they've, they've used the clone tool in Photoshop to take a picture of one, one of the clouds and stamp it in various places around the, around the, the, the picture. And they got lazy. Um, in, in another image, they've even Photoshopped the word sex in the clouds which is a subliminal uh, tool they use to get people to, to sort of relate to um, something. They literally, you can look at this and um, you can find it on, on NASA's website. In a video I'm, um, I'm working on at the moment, I've got a um, video from what they call the Galileo um, space probe. As it left Earth, it, it took a series of shots of Earth apparently. Um, and you see that uh, over the course of 25 hours, um, the clouds never move, okay? 
Now, I've, I happen to find um, some pictures of um, satellite pictures of Earth, and I noticed that in these separately taken satellite shots, the clouds were exactly the same as the ones in, the, um, in this Galileo shot. So it's a cloud map. It would be very simple indeed to just um, silence everybody, um, you know, put an end to this topic once and for all, turn the Hubble round and show us um, Earth in real time, zooming in onto a, a place so that we can see what's happening at that place and, and we know that there is something up there looking down on us um, um, from space. But they will not do it. They can't do it. It, 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 can't, it doesn't exist. It literally doesn't exist. When you go onto the plane tracking software, um, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of flights over the, uh, over the northern hemisphere, um, and you can track those flights from beginning to end. When you look at any flight in the, in the southern hemisphere, what you'll find is the, uh, the flight takes off and disappears off the tracking, um, usually about an hour after takeoff, and then later on will reappear an hour before landing. Um, now, there's no explanation for it. I mean, the, the, the point is that um, distances are very different, and distances and, and, and flight plans are very different on the flat Earth than they are on the ball. Um, and when you look at flights in the southern hemisphere, they, they make some really crazy, um, you know, sort of deviations. So, for instance, if we're looking on here, um, let's say a flight from Cape Town Cape Town over here to Australia, say, say Sydney and Australia, they will, they will take you to Dubai first, somewhere around here, yes. Just recently there was um, a case of a, a woman who uh, was pregnant on a flight and she, she was about, to, her waters broke on the flight. And I think it was from the Philippines to, um, to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And um, again, if you, look, uh, if you look on this, this map, you're from around here somewhere to, to here, okay? Now, they were flying across and, and literally um, she, her waters broke and they had to divert, they had to land. So instead of either going back to the Philippines or going on to uh, Los Angeles, they went, they landed in Alaska. <laughs> Which again, if you look on the, uh, on the flat map, it's again a, a straight path. Santiago, Chile to, to uh, uh, Australia mm -hmm. right, will, will usually stop in Los Angeles. Again, you can see on the flat map that it's again a straight path. It all seems to make sense and, uh, and if um, the only thing that would, uh, would sort of confirm it or disprove it would be GPS. But, you know, I hope GPS doesn't work in the, south, um, in the south and southern hemisphere. This is, a, this is a, um, an issue because um, there, there have been a few people who said they've taken flights that have taken only 14 hours and they've, um, they're direct flights from Australia to, um, to South America. Um, mm -hmm. Now, somebody has actually um, redrawn the flat map to take, in, um, take into account these, uh, um, you know, the, the distances, and apparently the distances work out. I haven't seen the map myself, um, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, I should be looking further into it. But, um, yes, uh, up, until, up until these people came forward, and, again, I, I haven't seen any real evidence that they have taken these flights. They, they told me they've taken these flights. But um, who, can, who knows? They can, they can actually... Um, advertise a flight that's uh, direct, you know, they can price it out of the range of uh, most people to, to take, and then if anybody does um, take it, they could cancel it. I, I don't think any flights actually fly directly over the, south, the North Pole at all. I think they, they skirt the North Pole, mm -hmm. but um, I don't think they fly directly over the, the actual pole. So I don't know if it's uh, to do with magnetics. The only thing I do know is that nothing flies um, over the South Pole. Um, because, again, on a flat map, the, the South Pole, the uh, continent of Antarctica, is the ring around the Earth. So, you know, you can't fly over, over the ring. Um, 
and, uh, and get anywhere. That's why we're not allowed to go there. I mean, think about it, it's the only treaty that's, that's uh, you know, uh, all these countries have signed and never broken and uh, have completely agreed on. It's the only one. And, you know, what, what treaty is there that everybody's agreed on? Um, we're, we're being kept away from it for a reason. You know, they have some scientific bases there, yeah, and, and literally it's controlled by the military. If you try and, uh, and go there by yourself, you will be uh, um, sort of picked up and uh, escorted back. Uh, there was a guy called Jarls Anderhoy who tried to, uh, to take a mission to, to the Antarctica and he was, he was picked up and, uh, and taken back by the military. Um, it's a good reason because they don't want you finding out what's, what's beyond. Admiral Byrd, he actually, he actually Admiral. did four, four um, expeditions. Aha, and Chetri. Um, and most of them were military expeditions with huge military groups, um, you know, th uh, thousands of people, you know, planes, boats, the, the works. Um, and, and yes, he confirmed in an in a interview that he discovered uh, a land, a continent, as big as the continental United States out there that was um, with, with warm water lakes and, and mountains and everything uh, that was completely uninhabited. And he, said, and he described it as the other side of the South Pole to Middle America. So um, on, the, on the globe, that means it would be somewhere in the Indian, Indian Ocean. There's a huge continent that nobody knows about. So, um, so yeah, there's, um, there's more going on than meets the eye. The other thing is, after Admiral Byrd came back after his last um, expedition, um, Antarctica was sealed off, and both America and... Um, in the, the, the Russians started firing nuclear missiles straight up. Um, now, in America, that was that was called uh, uh, Project um, Operation Fishbowl, and it came under something called Project Dominic. Well, Fishbowl makes you know it makes sense because uh, it seems like Admiral Byrd found the edge of the dome. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, while he was out there. And as soon as he left there, they started firing missiles straight up, I believe, to try and test how far that, that dome went. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the, uh, the um, footage of these explosions, what you'll see is an explosion. Well, when a, when a, a bomb goes off in midair, it's a fireball. It expands in all directions and mostly up, okay? Now, if you look at these um, explosions on um, Operation Fishbowl, they explode outwards in a ring, which means it's, be, it's exploding against something because it can't rise with the heat. So it's exploding against something and exploding outwards. Okay, and the middle of the explosion, you'll see it's, it, it glows, you know, hot, and then it cools over time. So it looks to me that they were exploding against a dome. Now. I said it was um, Operation Fishbowl, obviously Fishbowl, but the, um, uh, there's a chap called Rob Skiba who's, who discovered that the Project Dominic, the word Dominic means of the Lord, Fishbowl of the Lord. <laughs> so they, I, I believe they clearly know that we're in a, an enclosed system and um, Admiral Byrd found the edge and they've, they've tested to see mm -hmm. um, how far it goes up. They will also say that if a sniper is, um, you know, is trying to hit something a, a great distance, a couple of miles away, um, they have to take into consideration the spinning of the earth because they say that as the bullet leaves the muzzle of the gun, mm -hmm. it's now um, independent of the rotation of the earth. So, you know, the earth will spin away from where the bullet, and you have to take it, that into account. They say that about artillery shells as well, but it's not true. Um, if, if that was true, um, a sniper would have to spend ages and ages calculating how to, to, to make that shot. And they don't. They literally take into consideration the wind and, um, and you know, the, the elevation, and they don't take um, the Coriolis effect into, into consideration at all. Um, also, planes. If, if that works for, for bullets, if bullets, as soon as they leave the Earth, they're now independent of the spin, then why doesn't it work for planes? Yeah? Um, there's a, a video on YouTube that actually tries to explain um, 
that uh, the Coriolis effect works by using the, the um, example of a paper plane. You have to throw it, if you throw it north, the, uh, the, the earth will spin and the, the plane will land sort of, uh, you know, east. Um, but if you take the idea of a real plane, you know, a plane would have to aim north to go east in that case. But it, that's not what happens. And uh, if that was the case as well, um, planes would have to land on runways that are moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that would be impossible. But how is it that you can take a flight from London to, to New York and it would take exactly the same time as a flight from New York to London? Yeah? Um, one's with the spin of the planet and the other one's against it. So it, doesn't, again, doesn't make sense. Um, they'll say that uh, the whole atmosphere is moving yeah, um, with, the, with the planet, but that doesn't make sense either because um, you know, the atmosphere, say it's, it's that thick, the top layer of the atmosphere will be moving slow and uh, the, the, as far, the further you get in will be moving faster. Um, so, you know, how, if everything is moving like that, how do you get a, a, a light breeze that, uh, that, go, that blows against the spin of the planet? You know, um, how do you get a, a breeze that goes from north to south? It just doesn't make sense. And, and again, science will give you calculations and, and uh, you know, esoteric ideas, but uh, you, know, you can go out and look for yourself and, uh, and you'll, see, you know, you'll see what makes sense and what doesn't. The, the other thing is that you know, we, have, we have senses to be able to sense um, acceleration. You, know, you get in a car and uh, somebody puts their foot down you know, and you get thrown back in your seat, you can feel the acceleration. Yeah? You can feel changes, very minute changes of acceleration. <laughs> yeah? So how is it that if you live, if you live up here in Macedonia, yeah, which is spinning at maybe um, 700 miles an hour, yeah? because uh, the speed it's spinning is slower than this speed. So if you took a flight down to Africa, yeah, on the equator, why don't you feel the change in acceleration? Yeah, so why don't you feel the change in acceleration? You know, you have these senses that, that will register the slightest change. <laughs> yeah, um, but you get off the plane there and you don't feel dizzy, you know, because now you're, you're moving a lot faster. So, no, it doesn't make sense. Well, um, you know, you saw, you saw from the, his balloon when he, when he stepped out on the platform, mm -hmm. you know, the, the curvature of the Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looked very obvious. Oh, everybody pointed it and said, oh, look, there's a curvature. But when you actually looked at the ground, when you looked at the Earth, well, it was New, New Mexico. <laughs> That's where he jumped. The whole earth that you saw there was New Mexico. So if that was a curvature, the earth must be very, very small indeed, and New Mexico must take up a huge part of it. Yeah? It was a fisheye lens to, to curve that, to make that curve. Um, and when he jumped, it took, uh, I think it took him uh, uh, th like two hours to get to that height. Yeah, he went straight up. Mm -hmm. In that two hours, the earth should have rotated um, away quite a distance, but I think he only he, he only landed something like 70 kilometers away from from where he from where he, he sort of went up in the first place, and that can be uh, you know uh, attributed to the wind, you know. So no, I mean uh, that there's no proof whatsoever. There's so much there is so much to this. As I said, if you start looking and asking questions about the the very basic things you'll find that the answers you were giving, given as a child just do not make sense. So the idea there is that uh, it, must be, it must be a globe because uh, you know, the sun, if the sun's here, then it's got to be dark on the other side. Well, the thing about the sun is that we're told it's 93 million miles away. It's not. It's actually something around 3,000 miles away. Um, and about 34 miles across. Um, that might sound really um, crazy, but um, if you look, at the, um, uh, look out on a day that's uh, got broken cloud, you'll see that the sun rays will come out at an angle. Most people have seen this. The rays come, come down in a, uh, at angles. Um, 
If the sun was 93 million miles away, then all the light will be coming parallel. So if you imagine, you know, there's no way to show 93 million miles, but, but something way, way over there, all the light that reaches this globe will be parallel. There's no way that light can, can come that far and spread out like that. Now, if you follow those light rays, you'll see exactly where the sun is. And as I said, it works out to be about 3,100 miles. Now, if that's the case, and the sun is circling over this flat plane, yeah, its, its light range is limited. So it's illuminating the part of the Earth. It's, it's, uh, it's like um, over at the moment. So, say, over, over Europe, it might, or over Af um, South America there, it's over there, well, Australia's going to be in the dark because the sun isn't going to throw enough light to illuminate Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, now, most people say, well, I see the sun rise and set. How can that be if it's just going round in a circle? Well, that's perspective again. If you actually see a um, video of uh, the sun coming up and, and going down, um, many times you'll see that the sun starts off as it's coming up very, very tiny and it gets bigger as it gets closer to midday and then gets smaller again. It's literally that effect of perspective, you know, with some things above you, like the ceiling in a hallway, yeah, as it goes further away, as it goes further away, it will, it will seem to sink down towards the horizon until it disappears beyond your, the, the limit of your sight. And that's all you're seeing. You're seeing, you're seeing literally a, a, the sun circling overhead, but seeming to set. Um, there was a team in uh, California that uh, launched a rocket 75 miles up. Um, and you can find this video on YouTube. It's difficult to watch because the, uh, the cameras, there were seven cameras on this, on this rocket and uh, it was spinning as it went up. So it's very, I say, difficult to watch. Um, but this, this chap, Refi, uh, studied this video meticulously, looking for some kind of mistake or some kind of uh, uh, evidence. And he realized that he could see the moon. Um, so he went online to a, a website called timeanddate.com where it will show you graphically where the moon and sun is at any time um, on any day. Um, and he did a bit of detective work to find out exactly when the rocket was, um, um, was, was fired and found that the moon sh should have been on the other side of the planet um, over Australia. Um, now, the, the rocket was 75 miles up and it could see the moon, but anybody down on the ground wouldn't be able to see it. But the point is that if the, the moon was over Australia, on the other side of the, it would be on the other side of the planet, which is, okay, there. So down there on the other side of the planet and uh, the rocket went up here. So there's no way that rocket should have been able to see the moon on the other side of the planet. If you watch the trajectory of the space shuttle, it doesn't go straight up. It always goes in a curve um, and out to sea. The point is that they, they actually go horizontal. The space shuttle goes horizontal. It never goes any further up. It goes horizontal, um, very, very low down in the, in the atmosphere um, because it, lets, it drops its um, external tank um, while it's still in the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still in the atmosphere while it's uh, horizontal, so it never gets any higher and it goes out of sight, not because it goes too high, because it goes too far downrange. Um, and it seems that uh, nobody's ever on the space shuttle and the proof of that is the Challenger disaster. Um, in, uh, I believe it's 1986, the Challenger exploded just after takeoff and killed seven astronauts. But it turns out that six of the astronauts are still alive and uh, most of them are using their original names. Um, and you, you, know, uh, you can find pictures of them. They're, they're using the same names and they're, they're doing ordinary jobs now. Teachers, lecturers, um, lawyers, whatever. But, um, but they're still alive. I think it's a mock-up. I think it's uh, an empty shell and literally just dishes in the sea. 
um, out of sight. Um, and, and they have a, a plane that's mocked up to look like a space shuttle. And, um, and you can see whenever the space shuttle lands, um, you can hear it, it's, it's a loud jet engine. Um, you watch any, any video of uh, the space shuttle landing, it, you can tell it's a jet engine. Uh, that's a, it's a jet powered aircraft. That's it, it's not a glider. Um, in my video, I show you a glider, how that seems, and then I show you the, the space shuttle, and yeah, it's not a glider, it's, it's an aircraft. Um, and that's what they're fooling us, uh, taking billions of dollars in and giving us images and, uh, and, and fake planes um, for that 10 billion, you know, how ma however many billions of dollars it is. That you've got the external tank and the space shuttle, yeah. Um, it's, it's like um, horizontal at this point, and then they, um, they drop the tank. Okay, now the space shuttle isn't powered at this point because the tank has all the fuel. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, when the engine stops, the tank is dropped. Basically, the space shuttle and tank should follow the same path because no, neither of them are powered. Um, they should both fall the same, in the same way. Now, because the, the tank has all the fuel, those pods on the back of the, uh, the space shuttle aren't fuel tanks. They have a very, very small amount of fuel in there for orbital manoeuvring. But from this point, which again is still in the Earth's um, atmosphere because the tank you know, falling down. is falling there, um, th it now has to go from there into orbit. They haven't got the fuel there to, to insert it into orbit. Disney and NASA have worked very closely together. Disney worked with NASA on the, on the um, moon um, uh, uh, project. Yeah? They, they made it, they filmed it so that it would be uh, entertainment, entertaining for the masses. Yeah? Um, and they're still working with, with NASA. I absolutely believe that Stanley Kubrick um, you know, filmed the, the moon landing. He left, a, he left a few clues just to say, so that, you know. Like Michelangelo. Yeah. yeah, so that we eventually would know that this was his work, yeah? I did this. It's a, it's a joke. It was, meant to, it was meant to fool people in the ni in 1960s. So you, you got like clear footprint, but yet you don't have uh, where, an impression where the, foot, the pads of the uh, lunar lander were, or, or, or a blast crater where the engines were blasting downwards. And also, <laughs> the camera followed the, uh, followed the, the um, capsule straight up, mm -hmm. right? And it followed it very precisely, right? And it stopped when, when it uh, started to pitch over, right? Now, um, they, uh, NASA says, oh, we did it remotely. Well, there was a, a two or three second delay between sending signals and the camera starting to respond, and then another couple of seconds for them to see what the, what's happened. So there, it's, it's next to impossible to, to get that sort of accuracy with that kind of, uh, with that kind of, and it's only done once. I mean, it was, they can't sort of keep doing it over and get it right. They, you know, they do it once and uh, they got it right the first time. So no, it's uh, either they left an astronaut on the moon to film them <laughs> or, uh, or it was fake. It was fake. It was absolutely fake. There's not too many people involved in this. I mean, um, NASA uh, controls space as such. The other agencies, um, other agencies have popped up but literally, it's a, it's a money-making scheme. NASA makes, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Dobra, Rusi. Okay. The Russians, okay, they're, they're getting in on the act as well. You know, the, they, they make money from this. And have you seen the imagery that they put out? Um, the uh, Chinese have put out, or I think it was the Japanese that put out um, images of uh, Earth from the moon and it looks even more fake than NASA's ones. It's, it's, the, the, it's a money-making scheme and they're all joining the bandwagon. But, you know, the, this, that isn't the first thing that's been hidden over the years. I mean, we're all driving petrol cars because a because hundred years ago, the Rockefeller family uh, basically cornered the market on oil and the, um, the car industry was going electric. So, you know, 
all cars would have been electric from, from the get-go, but they basically forced um, everybody to use um, petrol cars and have hidden this secret. And, and literally, you know, we could be running around in electric cars that, that have um, unlimited mileage by now, but, uh, but we're still using these, these 100-year-old um, machines, dirty machines, because of a, a secret that's been, been kept. It's, it's, it's easy. If everybody's been trained into believing that this is real, right, um, and, uh, and there's space, and uh, it's, it's uh, within our interest to, to explore space and uh, you know, go to the moon, go to Mars, yeah, people will pay for it. And, um, and they're making billions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's, there's more to it, because I, um, I believe there's a, a big deception coming, and it's to do with aliens. Because now, um, since Roswell, uh, 1947, um, that was the first time anybody had ever understood the idea of aliens. But since then, we've been bombarded with, uh, with science fiction and the idea of aliens. And most people believe there are aliens out there. So they've prepared us for um, an alien invasion or, um, or an alien saviour. And I think the Flat Earth came came along at the right moment to educate people, to make people believe or, or, or understand that we've been lied to. And if you know, as I know in my heart now, that that is real and this isn't, I will not be fooled by aliens coming because there are no aliens, there's no space. Yeah? It's, it's all fantasy by, by Disney and NASA. Well, um, the Bible has a very, very clear view of what this, this, um, this place is. And it matches that place more than it matches this. Okay? And, and what it says is the great deep is under it. Just water. It's, it's just deep water. And above the firmament is water. And, you know, it says in, in Genesis that uh, he separated the water below from the water above and made a space. <laughs> and then made dry land appear out of the water. So um, what's under, under the, the flat earth? Well, it's water, and it just goes on. Um, again, I don't know for sure, because I've not been under there. I don't know what's, um, what's past the, uh, the outside of, or the, um, you know, the first few hundred miles of, uh, of Antarctica. But um, everything I've, I've seen over the last year and a half um, tells me that that is true and this isn't. And I'm starting to believe and trust my intuition about this. Um, nobody has actually um, really gone all the way across Antarctica. Yeah? Now, there are millionaires out there who, who could you know, assemble the resources to make an expedition and completely you know, go across and chart Antarctica and make a name for themselves, being the first person to do that. Yeah? But nobody ever does. Um, one, one thing I was going to say, which is slightly totally off topic, um, but the topic I, I, I really want to go to is that people, ordinary people, have become scientists through this. Okay? Um, you know, the science community is, is ignoring a lot of the things that we're looking at. And so normal people are going out and doing experiments. And one of the experiments has turned up um, an amazing fact that we've not been told. And it, it destroys the whole idea of this, this uh, heliocentric system. Um, and that is the moon. If you, um, if you get a piece of card, put it on the floor, and... Um, sort of, you put another piece of card to, to act as a barrier for the moonlight. So you have the moon above, card on the floor, and a piece of card in front to shield half of the uh, half of the card. Yeah. Now a lot of people have these um, laser thermometers. Now you can actually measure the temperature of the moonlight next to the measure the temperature of the uh, shade of the moonlight, and you'll find the moonlight is colder than the shade, the opposite from the sun. So the moon is throwing out its own light.
and that light is the opposite from the sun. Now, that tells you that it's not reflecting the sun's light. Uh-huh. It's producing its own, and its light is different from the sun's. So, you know, the scientific community have not told us this, yeah, because they won't tell us this, because um, it destroys this idea that the, the sun is, you know, is lighting up the moon. Uh, This world is very different from what most people think it is. Um, There are very powerful people who essentially rule this world right now. Um, And the ordinary person is a slave in this world. And slaves aren't educated. You know, they're taught what they need to, or, you know, they only need, they need to know, that's it. They're They're not taught truth they're taught what they need to know. Um, and so you're, you're taught enough so that you can you know, do the paperwork and operate the machinery, um, but you're not meant to know what's really going on because that's, what, that's the power they have over us. They know what's going on, what, you know, how, how this world works. We don't, so they can control us. One of the things uh, about slavery is uh, the, the slaves weren't freed. They were never freed. Um, when the uh, 14th Amendment or 13th Amendment, I can't remember which one, um, actually made everybody a slave. If, you be, if you're a citizen of a country, you're a, you're a slave. That's, that's what a citizen is. So they, they literally extended the slavery to everybody and made it an open prison. And, and that's where everybody in the, in the world lives now. We're, we're, we're slaves to very powerful masters. We don't see bars. No. Yeah? The bars are the, um, the borders of the country. Mm-hmm. Right? You, you have to use a pass to get out, mm-hmm. and they'll let you out if you show them your pass. Yeah? Um, and sometimes they won't let you out. Um, you know, um, as I was coming here, uh, I was lining up to, to go on the plane, and somebody, was, somebody in front of me was, said, was told, no, you can't, you can't fly. They found something in your bag, so you can't fly today. So, uh, you know, we have, as I said, we have natural rights to travel anywhere on this earth. We were born on this earth. We, you know, we have the right to travel anywhere. But uh, our masters have kept us in small pre- open prisons that uh, you need to get permission to, to move around. This idea that uh, you know, um, billions of years ago, nothing exploded and then everything came out of that nothingness. Um, ridiculous. But um, <clears throat> they tried to make you believe that, uh, that the idea that a, um, a supreme being, a creator, created this is ridiculous compared to that idea. I mean, um, they, you know, if you look at it objectively, they, you know, I, I would lean towards a creator because um, you know there's so much that points to um, you know the fingerprint of a, a creator, but it's no less ridiculous than, than nothing exploding and becoming something. Um, in my in my opinion, that the Big Bang theory and uh, the theory of evolution and the ball Earth theory are all interlinked, and they're all there to make us feel as though we're insignificant. We're small, small tiny, Miniature. unimportant uh, pieces of slime crawling around on a, on a speck of dust in an infinite universe. If that's true, and there's no purpose, there's no meaning to anything, then the, our owners can do whatever they want with us. Then, you know, this is all accidental, so food can be genetically modified <laughs> because it's imperfect. You know, we can be modified because we're imperfect, you know. Um, If we realise that this is the universe and we... Complete universe. Yes, this system is the complete universe, is everything. Everything that NASA has put put out is CGI, is fake, okay. Um, You know, people say, I think you mentioned it, um, you know, if you look out in the, into the universe, you see that uh, the moon is round, you know, spherical, and the planets are spherical, and uh, so why are we flat? Well, um, how do you know that the planets and the, and the stars are spherical? 
You know, all you get is, if you look for a telescope, you see a flat disk. If you think you see a, um, a spherical shape there, well, it needs two eyes to, to, to resolve 3D. If you're looking for a telescope, you can't see anything in 3D. It's going to be flat anyway. So all you see is a flat blob of light. It's only NASA that's given you these beautiful pictures of, uh, of, of so-called planets and stars. Yeah? Um, so so it's, it's, it's a fallacy to say, well, everything else out there is, uh, is spherical, so we must be. You know? How, this is special. You know? So why... It's, it's like saying um, a basketball is round, so why isn't a court round? You know? <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's a fallacy. So this is this uh, idea of a ball Earth, theory of evolution, the Big Bang, is all about making us feel nothing so that we can be used. If everybody realised how special we all are, how unique every single life is, then this whole world would change overnight. We wouldn't allow ourselves to, to be used by this cabal. We wouldn't allow this planet to be destroyed <laughs> because they're destroying it because, oh, it's just an accidental planet, one of millions. We've found other Earths, you know. Eventually, if this one gets too messed up, we'll go to another one. No, <laughs> this, is, this is it. So if, if we all realise that, then we wouldn't allow all, this thing, all these things that are going on. It's all about um, control. There are a small group of people who want to control the world. And because there's so many of us out there, you know, they can't control us directly. They can't, you know, this small group of people can't, um, you know, come round to all of us and, and control us directly. So they must use our own minds, our own hearts and minds against ourselves. And this is what they've done. They've, they've educated us into this world, uh, into this globe spinning, you know, heliocentric, big bang, evolution world, uh, which makes us nothing. This is, this is amazing because um, when I first started looking, it was about a year and a half ago, I looked on YouTube and there were maybe about a hundred videos, um, not even that probably, um, and nobody was talking about it. Right? And then over the last, over 2015, it exploded. There are uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people looking at, uh, at Flat Earth now. And what happens is, is that you'll watch something or read something and it, something will strike a, a chord in your mind and you'll think, yeah, I, I've always wondered that. And what will happen is, you will start feverishly researching I mean, I, what happened to me was, as soon as I, I got that, I, I spent every waking hour looking for things and testing things. And, um, and this seems to be replicated with, with thousands of people around the world who suddenly come into this. They start you know, researching and, and getting a, a passion for this because this is what I think. It's the truth. And we recognise the truth when we hear it. And we, um, you know, we feel it. And, and this, this I, again, I believe, has come at the exact right time so that we, we awaken to what's going on in the world. Nothing else, you know, 9-11 even, hasn't awoken people, right, to this extent. You know, for me, um, I've, I've been an atheist for 40 years. Um, from the age of 13, you know, I... I didn't want anything to, to do with God and Bibles and whatever and religions. Um, and now I know for a fact there is a creator. I've seen his fingerprint, you know, not just with the flat earth. Everything I've done in the last um, five or ten years has led me to, to see that there is a creator now. Um, and, um, and there's a, a, a great many uh, people out there who have had exactly the same um, revelation as I have, um, and it, it is. I'm, I'm now following the commandments and trying to be the best human being that I can be because I think it was a guy called Kent Hovind who said um, there are only two possibilities. 
either there is a God or there isn't. And both of them are terrifying. Yeah. If there isn't a God, then nobody's in control. We're hurtling through space and, and there's no plan and there's no, there's no nothing. And, you know, that's terrifying. If there is a God, then we'd better find out who he is and what he wants and do exactly what he says. And it turns out that he gave us very specific instructions on how to live. Um, and they're not, they're not rules as in, you know, laws that you, you know, that um, you must do, follow uh, because, uh, you know, or put you in prison if you don't. No, these are, these are, are rules to live by, to, to make a harmonious world. You know, don't, don't harm anyone, don't kill anybody, don't steal from people, you know, don't covet people's items, you know. Don't lie. Don't lie. I mean, <laughs> these, these things are written in our hearts anyway. Yeah, but we're in a society that um, that legalizes all of the Ten Commandments. You know, the policemen and soldiers can kill; they're allowed to kill. Yeah, you know, politicians even, can lie. They can lie. Um, they're lying all the time. Actually. They're lying all the time. Police have been told that they are allowed to lie to try and get um, to to catch somebody. Yeah, they're allowed to lie. Um, everything in the Ten Commandments is legalized in this society. That tells you who runs this society. Yeah. So, so yeah. This this is this is a profound movement. I don't like using the word movement, but it's a profound shift in consciousness for people because, um, unlike any other uh, topic that's that's come out in the last few years, this one has made people realise that they've been lied to. Sun's behind a glass firmament. The molten look, molten looking glass, like the Bible says. They're going up, and the astronaut thinks he's leveling off this way, going around, when in effect he's leveling off this way, and he goes around in a circle, this, like so. The farther out he goes, less he sees of the earth. He makes a bigger circle, he can make as big a circle as he likes. And which is in effect exactly the same as if he was going around the world this way and going out farther, he makes a bigger, bigger, a larger orbit. Through time-lapse photography, the velocity of these clouds has been dramatically increased. While they were actually drifting over the mountains at approximately 27 miles per hour, they now have the appearance of moving at well over 100, four times their normal speed. If the clouds were stationary and the Earth was revolving underneath them, this is how it would appear if the Earth was spinning at 100 miles per hour. Yet we're told that the Earth is spinning at 10 times that speed. Consider this. Those who maintain that the Earth is a globe that spins suggest that people standing at the equator are being whirled around at approximately 1,000 miles an hour. They further maintain that the Earth is spinning around the Sun at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour, and that our Sun is supposedly racing around the center of our galaxy at some 600,000 miles per hour. And yet, you and I both know that on many days it's possible to stand outside without a single hair being messed up by the breeze. You put your hand outside a, a window of a, of a car, which is going even at 80 kilometers per hour, a terrific wind goes blasting by and pushes your hand back. Imagine putting your hand outside the window of a car that's going 1,600 kilometers per hour. We just take your hand right off. With a sphere of 4,000 miles radius being a, a spun around once every 24 hours, a little bit of calculations will show that that person there is being spun around at about 1,000 miles an hour and it doesn't know it. I mean, this is obvious nonsense. You go on a merry-go-round and it goes, I doubt, more than 10 miles an hour and you get off all dizzy. You mean to tell me that people can be spun round at approximately 1,000 miles an hour and not know it? Why, if this is so, this whole room that we're in it is supposedly being spun round at something of approximately that order of speed and we don't know it? There's all kinds of evidence for the phenomenon of what's called continental drift. 
That, this means that the, the continents are able to move as if they're floating on a fluid. Now, if the Earth is, is spherical, if it's spinning, can any, anybody knows that if this is spinning very, very, very fast like that, that the continents should all be located at the equator because centrifugal force would move the continents from the poles to the middle. One of the uh, real big problems that it maybe is a little bit easier to understand, sound uh, doesn't travel nearly that fast. So, for example, if you're at the equator and uh, you wanted to shout to warn somebody, it's quite possible they could never hear you because if you're shouting, say the Earth was spinning in this direction, and you're shouting in that direction, the sound could never catch up to the person who's, of course, being carried away by the Earth. In October of 1929, Andrea again tried to focus the world's attention on the controversy by proving the notion the Earth spins to be absolute nonsense. It was reasoned that if a dirigible was to go aloft in England and hold itself perfectly static, then by the accepted theory the Earth should rotate underneath it and New York should come into view some four or five hours later. In fact, England was never lost from view. The dirigible eventually ran low on fuel and had to land. Andrea insisted she had made her point. But New York wasn't paying attention that day. The stock market crash monopolized the headlines then and for some time to come. Andrea had again been upstaged. By November of 1938, Andrea was prepared for her second attempt to reach the edge. A consortium of financiers were providing her with a plane and a large enough crew to make a legitimate go of it. And so, once again, an optimistic Andrea found herself in Antarctica. And once again, fate was against her. A freak spring blizzard took them by surprise. They were unable to leave base camp, much less make a trip to the edge. The entire expedition was very nearly wiped out. That was the last attempt Andrea made until 23 years later, when she set off alone by snowmobile in 1961. Until recently, that was the end of the story. Early this year, a researcher stationed in Antarctica to study weather patterns found a snowmobile partially buried in a snowbank. It had run out of fuel and there were no signs of Andrea anywhere. But he did find these, a camera and a note. The note says only, I have been there, the debate finally comes to an end. Signed, Andrea B. It had survived the frozen elements for nearly 30 years. Unfortunately, the researcher inadvertently opened the camera, exposing the film inside. Any pictures were lost, and Miss Barnes' trip is still very much shrouded in mystery. There was no description of what she had seen or how far away it was. But if we are to believe the note, then Andrea Barnes was very likely the first person in history to visit the edge of the earth. Now, what you don't know, you eliminate. And that is, that's, in my opinion, is what the, uh, the globular earth theorists have done. They've just eliminated what they didn't know. The uh, more honest approach is the flat earth approach, where you say, well, we don't know what's at the ends, but, but the ends are there. A little video, the sun and the moon, something rather strange. There's a bit of a flat horizon there. What you can see here, it's like the Andalusian Mediterranean, is the sun's fully in the sky. And also, the moon is fully in the sky. But we can't see all of the moon. Why is it not full? 
we're told in mainstream science that the sun's angle to the moon creates the phase. And the moon's completely lit by the sun. So why is that area of shade not lit? The whole sun can see the whole moon in the sky. So it doesn't make sense. I think people are looking at looking into books and televisions more than looking with their eyes, maybe. Also, this phenomena we see, I mean, it pretty much proves the moon's, you know, the sun's not 93 million miles away and the moon's not, was it, 250,000 or something miles away. Or you get a completely different phenomena. They're both probably within a thousand miles of the humans here on Earth. And no one looks up really. People don't even look up at chemtrails. There we go. Sun and moon in the sky. Both can see each other at a complete straight angle. And the moon's not full.